Hello everybody, welcome to Snyder's Inc. Um, I wasn't planning to do a Mr. Ball in one. Uh, I'm gonna be honest. Uh, I had one planned. I had a schedule to upload. And then it got blocked. It got copyright blocked. Uh, so, can't do that one. Uh, so we got this one. We got a Mr. Ball in one. Because you go to what works if you don't know what else to do. This one is, this man is about to live a nightmare. And we will get right into this. Ladies and gentlemen, hit the like button, hit subscribe button, comment, think down below. Let's go. Thousand, a handwritten note was discovered at the bottom of the ocean up in the Arctic Circle, and it revealed this absolutely horrifying true story. But before we get into that story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you come to the right place because that's all we do, and we upload once or twice every week. So if that's of interest to you, please invite the like button to go on a long bike ride with you, but make sure before you step off, you replace the water in their water bottles with hot dog water. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's story. On the morning of August 12, 2000, 33 of Russia's best naval warships stopped inside of a particular section of the Barents Sea. The Barents Sea is this 800-mile stretch of freezing water up in the Arctic Circle, just northwest of Russia, and these 33 ships were in this stretch of water for this huge military training exercise. Basically, they were going to run through some war game scenarios, where, for example, one ship would pretend to be an enemy combatant, and the other ships would work on locking onto that ship and firing at them. But of course, they wouldn't use real missiles or torpedoes. They would use duds that didn't actually explode. And so around... Um, is, that the, uh, is this a thing of military actually do now? This is 2000. That's why I'm curious. Is this a thing they do now in 2023? Do we go out and seize and practice what we're doing? Practice certain scenarios? Is that a thing that military still do? Around 9 a.m., the man who was in charge of this entire operation... I won't say it's a bad idea. I'm just saying, I'm curious if people still do it. His name was Admiral Popov, and he was actually on board one of these 33 ships. He authorized one of the submarines that was out there to shoot two of their dummy torpedoes at a target, an enemy combatant, which was actually just one of the other ships. And so as soon as he did this, he was authorizing the start of this multi-day long exercise. And so all day and all night, they're doing these war game scenarios. And by the following morning, so 24 hours into this exercise, Admiral Popov stepped away from the action to speak with Russian reporters on the phone and during this interview he tells them that so far the training exercise is going exactly to plan and that it looks like it will ultimately be a huge success however there was a problem at the same time Admiral Popov is giving his remarks to the reporters about how well this exercise is going the family members of some of the crews that were out there as part of this exercise they heard a rumor that the exercise was not going to plan, that in fact, something bad had happened to one of the ships. But none of the family members... I mean, it's just a rumor, right? Like, that's what it started. It's just a rumor, so... I don't know if you can get stressed. I mean, you obviously would get stressed out because the rumor is someone happened and your family's out there. You're obviously going to be worried and try to figure out if it's true or not. But... Um, it's figuring out if it's actually true or not had any more information beyond that. Even though this rumor was just that, a rumor, the family members of these crews that are participating in this exercise, they naturally became very worried. And so they all, that morning, began calling the naval base where the 33 ships had originated, asking for more information. And the phone operator on the base that was receiving all of these calls that morning at first was telling these family members that, no, nothing's going on, I haven't heard anything, there's, there's no issues. But eventually, this phone operator let slip that, in fact, they too had heard the rumor that something bad had happened, and they think it actually might be true. But when this family member who heard this pressured the phone operator for more information, the operator clammed up and said, you know, I can't give you anything else. And so 
He probably doesn't even actually know. He probably heard, like he said, he said he heard the rumor, so you can't. He doesn't have information. He just heard a rumor. He just heard it. Someone told him. He doesn't know for sure. So you couldn't tell him anything else anyways. So at that point, the family member hung up the phone and called the media and told them what was going on. And the media, as soon as they had the story, they went right to Admiral Popov and they said, hey, can you address this rumor? And he didn't. He did not respond to any of the Okay, that's sketch. He's already sketch. Did you in, in a span of a few minutes, this man has already went from a leader to a sketchy, sketchy dude. He's already sketchy. Immediately, they're like, "Hey, can you confirm this rumor that there's one, an accident happened, and there's a problem, and some people might be in danger?" Now, if there wasn't a rumor, if it's not true, you easily just say no. You just say no, and that's it. And there you go. That's rumor proven. But this guy ignored them and wouldn't answer the question, which makes me believe in my mind that there is a rumor that's pretty much confirming it. You just don't want to say it because it makes you look like shit. Despite the fact that if you don't figure out what the issue is and the people end up bad, you're going to look like shit media's inquiries and in a weird way that was kind of reassuring to the family members of these crews what? because they're thinking you know if admiral popov is just kind of ignoring this rumor and he's staying out there out on the barren sea still conducting this exercise then certainly nothing bad could have happened no see that'd be the opposite for me no 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 the moment you're ignoring the rumor because you can, why can't he just shut it down if someone goes if someone went to me and i'm the leader of this thing whole training exercise and if someone comes to me and from the media and goes hey there's this rumor that someone's gone something's gone down in a uh a body of boats or someone an accident happened and people are in danger can you confirm this rumor or can you address this rumor my main reaction would be if there's nothing going on that no there's nothing happening literally nothing's happened everything is fine This rumor is ridiculous, and I don't know where it started, and it's, 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 it's not true. Everything is fine. Everyone is safe. That's just how you say it. But when you know it, to me, in my head, I guess the other family members are different, but in my head, why can't you just shut it down? That makes me, that make me more believe it's true than make me believe it's not true. Happened, right? And so for the rest of that day, Sunday, the family members of these crews and the media just kind of did nothing because there wasn't anything else to do besides wait to see if there was any new news coming out of this exercise. And the following day on Monday the 14th, so 48 hours after the start of this training exercise, there would be news. Russian officials would go on TV and they would address the rumor by saying, well, yeah, it is true. Something did happen out during this exercise. See, I know better. I know better. I know a sketchy person and a sketchy responses. He didn't respond. I was like, well, that must mean it's true. Turns out it was true. They finally said it. Did they say it after it was too late? Did they just wait until everyone died before they said it? I mean, it wouldn't fucking surprise me. It's Russia. The Kursk, which was the name of one of the submarines that was one of the 33 ships that was part of this exercise, they experienced some minor technical difficulties that forced them to ground their vessel at the bottom of the Barents Sea. But don't worry, this is normal, we're in touch with them through the radio, everybody is fine. What do you mean by minor technical difficulties? What does that mean? We are pumping air and power into their submarine and before long we will have them back on the surface, there's nothing to worry about. Now. How? Do I don't understand this? Stuff? How do you how do you send an air into their? Am I the only one that actually doesn't understand? How do you pressure air underwater? How do you send air underwater? Because like I guess you have an oxygen thing, but I don't think you could do that. To there's not one that would work for the entire submarine. How do you? I'm, I'm actually confused. I'm actually confused by this. Naturally, the family members of the Kursk crew specifically, they panicked when they heard this because even though the government is acting totally confident that everything is fine, they did not feel confident that everything was fine. They're well, my response would have been immediately, the moment my thing would be like, oh no, I have no confidence. You don't know why I got no confidence? Because y'all did say there was a problem in the first place. And y'all don't say there's a problem. 
It makes me more believe that there was definitely a problem. Family members are trapped on the bottom of the ocean. But at the same time, they remembered the Kursk, the actual submarine, was a very special and very safe submarine. Oh, the it? Kursk was quite literally Russia's best ship. They had spared no expense on it. It was extremely expensive. And just because if it's expensive doesn't mean it can't be destroyed. The Titanic says hello when it comes to that story. The Titanic had a bunch of money spent on it. It's made to look as amazing as can be. And once it freaking crashed into an iceberg, it went down. Just because you put money into it does not mean it's safe. And it was massive. It was bigger than two football fields put together. And it was constructed out of this very specialized, highly reinforced steel that allowed it to take a direct hit from a torpedo and just keep on going, no problem. It was also outfitted on the inside with all the latest and greatest technology. And so if you were going to be stuck at the bottom of the ocean inside of a submarine, you would want to be stuck inside of the Kursk. And so the families took solace in that. But over I, I disagree. Say, uh, to me, it just wouldn't matter where it is. I, there'd be no salt. There'd be no calmness. It'd just be get them the f safely. Get them out of the goddamn submarine in safely. That's it. Over the next couple of days, despite the government reassuring everybody in the news that everything was fine, it's totally minor, we're going to have the curse cup and... This guy is the most nerdiest human being I've ever seen. As a grown man, this man looks like the ultimate nerd. Tell me you couldn't see this man as a nerd in high school. Look at him. I'm sorry, I had to say it. it he does, though. No time, despite all that, the Kursk still had not been raised to the surface. And the government was not giving the families or the media any new information. Are they just ignoring the fact this is happening? Are, we lit are they literally just pretending it's not happening? Are they like, no, it's fine, no, no, they'll find, no, they'll find their way back up. Is that what their, their thought process is? Them guys will find their way somehow back up. They can't be that stupid, right? Like, they can't be. And so in this kind of void of no real information, the families began to panic and the media began to speculate. Did the Kursk really suffer from minor technical difficulties like the government was saying? Or was this something more serious? This question would be answered on August 21st, so nine days after this training exercise had begun, when a Norwegian dive team, they were out there to assist in the recovery effort, they were able to... Nine days late. It took you nine days before you got them out. How does it take you nine days to get this ship out? This, it can't be that difficult. Am I, am I stupid? This can't be that difficult. It can't be take nine days for Russia to gather the stuff to lift the submarine up if it was that big of an emergency. What? dive down to the Kursk and they actually got inside of the submarine through an escape hatch. An escape hatch is like this watertight closet that kind of sits on the outside of the submarine and it allows people to go in and out of the submarine without flooding it. And once these Norwegian divers got inside of the Kursk and had a look around, they were totally shocked at what they saw. While the exact details of what happened inside the Kursk are still debated today, and probably will be for some time, there is one aspect of the story that is more or less universally accepted, and that is what happened inside of compartment number nine. The Kursk was divided into nine watertight segments called compartments. Number one was at the front of the submarine, and then it went two, three, four, all the way down to nine in the very back of the submarine. And the reason we know what happened inside of compartment number nine is because a 27-year-old Kursk crew member, Dmitry Kolesnikov, told us. Dmitry was born into a family of submariners. His father was a submariner, and his father's father was a submariner, and Dmitry idolized them, and so growing up, that was all he ever wanted to be. 
And in the late 1990s, his dream would become a reality when he commissioned as a naval officer in the Russian Navy and was given orders to serve on board the Kursk. Four months before this training exercise out in the Barents Sea, Dmitry met and very quickly married a high school teacher named Olga. And right after their wedding, one of the first things he did is he brought her on board the Kursk for a tour. And Olga brought along a video camera and filmed me asked. This isn't insulting her. It's just the name Olga is a weird name. I don't know why anyone would want that as their name. It, there's just a weirdness about the name Olga that I don't like. Filmed her tour through the ship. And on this video, Dimitri is all smiles. He is Literally so happy to be leading her around the ship and introducing her to people and showing her all the cramped spaces on board the submarine. It's really obvious that Dimitri was so proud of his job not only of his job but also just so proud to be sharing this part of his life with his wife fast forward to august 12th 2000 and dimitri along with 117 other crew members on board the kursk had just arrived at their designated section in the barent sea for this training exercise and at 11:27 a.m the captain of the kursk came over the radio and he told admiral popov who was not on the kursk he was on a separate ship he told the admiral that the kursk was about to fire their two dummy torpedoes after this call was made the men in the first compartment of the Kursk. So at the very front of the Kursk, this is where all the torpedoes, both fake and real, are stored. They began loading these two dummy torpedoes. Meanwhile, Dimitri was all the way back in the seventh compartment, the engine room. That was where he was stationed. He was actually in charge of everybody who worked in the seventh compartment. And so as these two dummy torpedoes are being loaded, Dimitri and his men, there weren't that many of them, they were twisting dials and pulling levers, when all of a sudden there's this really loud crashing sound and then the ship shudders and then jolts hard to one side, as if someone had grabbed the front of the submarine and just forced it to one direction. What Dimitri and the men in the seventh compartment could not have possibly known was that one of the real torpedoes in the first compartment had malfunctioned and it exploded. But because of how... What? what? How? how? How did it just malfunction? How did it just malfunction and explode? I was wondering, I thought someone accidentally shot like a real torpedo at them. Acted like. And he didn't want to confess. That's the reason Pop Off didn't want to confess because it was like maybe his ship. He didn't want to make his ship like killed men because they were stupid. So he didn't want to admit that. So that's why he left it. No, this was a malfunction at. Um. This dude's, uh, there was just a malfunction in the, well, malfunction at the goddamn junction and malfunction with a fucking torpedo. Like, goddamn. Well built the Kursk was, how strong the exterior walls were, this torpedo, as advertised, did not puncture through it. It did a lot of damage and caused a massive fire, but the sub was not sinking. So back in the seventh compartment, Dimitri, he stands up from being jostled to the ground and the alarms are going off and everything is totally... Well, also in fairness to this torp thing, this submarine was not built for a torpedo to go off inside the goddamn submarine. That was not part of the uh, plan in here chaotic everyone's asking what's going on and dimitri he takes charge and he tells his men to follow the emergency protocol which was to seal the watertight doors of your compartment and so in this case he sealed both the doors one leading to the sixth compartment and the other leading to the eighth compartment there's a lot of reasons for why they do this, but in essence, if there's a leak somewhere in the submarine, by sealing off your compartment, you protect yourself from being flooded. As Dimitri and his men are sealing these two doors, they would have begun to see and smell smoke as it came in through the ventilation ducts because there was now this uncontrolled fire raging at the front of the submarine. They also would have felt the submarine suddenly pitch upward at a very steep angle as the captain of the Kursk desperately tried to surface. But before they could reach the surface, that uncontained fire reached the other live torpedoes and it set off this almost instantaneous chain reaction of explosions. This second collapse. That makes more sense. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, that would act that would realistically happen. Yep. That's realistic. One torpedo goes off, 
there was a big fire, it would hit the other torpedoes, and then one after the other, after the other, after the other, it explodes, just one after the other, and it continues to happen, which causes that to happen. That makes complete sense to me. Collective blast killed virtually everyone in the front half of the submarine. Either the blast itself blew them apart, or once this hole in the front of the submarine, because the second blast did puncture the walls. Again, I'm about to say, they weren't, that, this thing was not planned for torpe torpedoes to be blown up inside the thing. Like, so that, yeah, this, this, literally there was nothing they could have done to plan for this. Once that hole was created, all this Arctic water began flooding into the submarine. So if you didn't get killed by the blast, you very quickly drowned. The only people who survived the first and second explosions were anyone in the sixth compartment going backwards. So six, seven, eight, and nine. And so Dimitri and the other men in the seventh compartment, they would have been definitely badly shaken up from that second explosion. That completely rocked the submarine and sent them tumbling all over the place but they would have been very alive and very aware of the terrible situation they were in. And so I would imagine that Dimitri and the others tried to grab onto any of the piping or anything they could as the submarine, because the control tower has been destroyed, just angled straight down and began careening downward. At 11.32 a.m., just four minutes after that initial explosion, the Kursk slammed nose first into the ocean floor, 350 feet below the surface, and in the back half of the Kursk came down to rest. We don't know exactly what happened on board the Kursk for those first two hours after they hit the ocean floor. What we do know is they had power, so there was light inside of the submarine. Also, the air purifiers were still working, so despite the chemicals and smoke that was in the air, it was relatively easy to breathe. During those first two hours, we also know that at some point, Dimitri and the other men in his compartment must have heard banging coming from the sixth compartment, because remember, they had sealed off the doors both to the eighth and the sixth compartment and so Dimitri decided to break emergency protocol and he opened the door to the sixth compartment to allow any of the survivors that were banging on the door to come into their compartment and when Dimitri and his men opened that door and looked into the sixth compartment they would have seen that it was rapidly flooding and most likely anybody forward of that compartment so five four three two one they were already dead. By 1.30 p.m., Dimitri and- So wait, was there not anyone banging? Did he just hear go- Did no one bang on the dang thing actually then? Alrighty. And his men in the seventh compartment and the other survivors from the sixth compartment, oh, the they were forced to retreat from the seventh over to the eighth compartment and then finally into the ninth compartment because of flooding. Even though they had sealed off their watertight doors, the walls were no longer watertight because this huge explosion had sent shrapnel flying down the body of the submarine, puncturing holes in all of the walls. And so it didn't matter if you shut your watertight door, eventually, as as one compartment would fill up, it would begin leaking through all the cracks in the walls. And so Dimitri and all of the people he was with, they would have been very aware of that. And so by the time they got all the way back to the ninth compartment. So did, did no one try to rescue these guys? Did literally no one try to rescue these guys at all? They just left them there to deal with this? Did no, you can't tell me no one knew this happened. What? the very back compartment there was nowhere else to go the water was going to eventually reach them and they were doomed unless they got rescued or if they left out of the escape hatch despite how absolutely terrifying this situation must have been dimitri remained calm in fact he was so calm that he pulled out a piece of paper as he's sitting in this cramped ninth compartment with these 22 other men and he writes the date and time in the corner and then he begins to kind of describe what had happened he talks about there being an explosion and he thought he and these 22 men were the only survivors and he says they're now trapped in the ninth compartment and they have to wait for rescue he also talks about how they had considered going out the escape hatch but apparently it hadn't worked after dimitri wrote this well here was my question right guess literally they're in they're in they're in uh they're not doing a submarine so they're not in like swimming you know underwater swimming gear you know what i mean so 
I don't think all of them could have swam out anyways. I don't think some of them, like, not, none of them, at least some of them, or not even, or all of them might not have been able to make it. Because 200 feet below is a long time to swim. It was a long swim. This very neat, very legible, very organized note, he folded it up and put it in his pocket, and then for the next hour and a half, he sat inside of the ninth compartment with the 22 others, and the power went out, which thrust them into absolute pit. Is this movie based off of this? Or is this just a totally different movie? This is an actual question I'm curious. Is this an actual movie based off of this? Or is this just a random movie that just happened to be in a summary? And the power went out, which thrust them into absolute pitch darkness. I mean, completely black inside of there. And the temperatures, because the power was out, suddenly began to plummet. And then the worst part was the water began seeping through the walls. And so Dimitri and the other men, they would have known that it's just a matter of time before this room fills completely with water and there is nowhere to go. And so with the water rising all around them, Dimitri pulls that paper back out of his pocket and he adds to the note. And this time, his handwriting is barely legible. And it's because he's probably suffering from hypothermia, so he's shaking. He can't see what he's writing. In fact, he writes the words, I'm writing blind, to indicate it's totally dark in the room. And in this second note, he leaves on this piece of paper, which was dated and timestamped an hour and a half after the first one, Dimitri indicates that he does not think he's going to survive. It's very clear none of them think they're going to survive. Yeah. Then, with the remaining space on this piece of paper, Paper, Dimitri writes this very loving and very thoughtful message to his wife and his family saying goodbye and then his final words on this note are regards to everybody no need to despair Kolesnikov after he this man is on the verge of death he knows he's gonna die yet his first, the last thing he writes is telling everyone be, like regards to everyone become like putting his peep his wife and all that at peace which is insane like what a guy and what a man to have that type of thought process that that's what your next thing is wrote this second message on this note he folded the paper up put it in his breast pocket and then in total darkness listening to the sound of water rushing into the room he and the other 22 damned souls prepared to die. We don't know how long Dimitri and the other 22 men survived in compartment nine, but experts say the entire Kursk submarine was completely flooded eight hours after the initial explosion. One of the most heartbreaking aspects of this case is that Dimitri and these 22 other men could have potentially been saved if the Russian response was a little bit more urgent and coordinated. Despite two of the ships, including the ship that Admiral Popov was on, hearing and feeling the second explosion that the Kursk experienced, nothing was done about it. It was reported, but no one... What? I feel like I had to end this by this part of what they could have done to attack. I'm going to end up getting so mad at the Russian fucking army here. I'm going to get so pissed. How do you... You hear the expl- You feel the fucking explosion. Why did you not do nothing? Why would you have not done nothing? Why would you have not been like, Hey, you know that, uh, Someone should go- Hey, tell, like, another submarine to go down where the curse was. See if everything's alright, cause we just heard an explosion from where they usually are, so- Where they are, so, go check on them, like, why is, everyone, why is everyone's reaction in almost every situation to just not do anything? I don't fucking get it. This is, this is so fucking angry inducing. No one really did anything. And then when no one could get in touch with the Kursk after they had said they were going to fire those two dummy torpedoes, everybody else, all the other ships, Admiral Popov, they all just said, you know what? I'm sure it's just the radios and they're fine and they'll be in touch soon. Of course they did. Of course, they all could be in a war. 
think of being an actual war and some situation will happen. They're like, no, they're fine. They're fine. We're just going to leave them or we'll let them do that thing because nobody would. No one wants to do anything. I've come to the conclusion that we live in a day and age where people use laziness as their way to avoid helping anyone in almost every situation, life or death. They would rather still, if they knew lives were at risk, they'd still rather do nothing and just sit there and do their own shit and be lazy as, and not actually do anything than to help the people. It's actually insane to me how lazy most people are when it comes to these things. Because every time there's always that situation, usually in every Mr. Bond wheel, where no one chooses to do nothing despite the fact everyone could tell there's a problem. But nobody wants to do anything. And it pisses me off every time. And so it wasn't until later that evening when the Russian Navy even figured out there was a major problem with the Kursk, that the Kursk has vanished. And then it would be several hours before they even got a rescue submersible in the water down to the Kursk. And then once it was down there, they could not latch onto the escape hatch on the submarine. And so Palmer probably just feels like any little pop-off just took forever to fucking even arrange it. He probably was just sitting there doing his own shit. And he's like, I'll get to it. I'll get to it at some point. They're fine. Like, because clearly they don't give a fuck. They could not kill less about these people. And so even if there were survivors inside of the submarine, they would not have been able to exit into this rescue submersible. And so for days and days, the Russians struggled to try to get inside of the submarine and kept turning down foreign aid from Norway, from America, from Great Britain. And then finally, you know why I don't because they want to have their little fucking pride. They don't care about saving lives. They just want pride. I mean, in this situation, it, like, these guys were dead before they even noticed the curse was gone because they were so ignorant to actually trying to help people. But in this situation, they couldn't even think because these, in army, and these, what are the Russian army had too much pride and didn't want to confess that they weren't the all, end all, be all that could sit there and fucking, uh, deal with it all on their own, so... Even though they needed help, they wouldn't file, They wouldn't fucking do it until they finally realized, yeah, you kind of need it. Stupid. Nine days after the Kursk had sank, the Russians did accept foreign aid, and that's when the Norwegian dive team, they went down and they were able to open up the escape hatch, and when they went inside the submarine, they saw it was completely flooded, there were bodies floating everywhere, and that's when ultimately Dimitri's body was found, and they found that note tucked in his breast pocket. Russia would go on to award the entire crew of the Kursk with the Order of Courage, which is a very significant military award, and the families of the crew of the Kursk were given 10 years salary each. They were also given free housing in any Russian city and their children would all have their college education paid for. So that's going to do it guys. If you found Hmm. Interesting. I'm trying to think if that's not, like so you get 10 years of 10 years salary. So I don't know, like, do they give it to you all at once? Like, just just 10 years worth of salary? Or, like, I guess they just do it every, like, normal paycheck, I guess. And then they were given free housing anywhere in any Russian city. I don't know how you arrange that. I don't know if you call specific people. I'm just curious now with this one. Do you just call a certain person and be like, I want to live in this area, this air, like, in this city? And then they're like, okay, here's all the available houses. Go pick one. Like, I don't know how that's set up. And then college education being paid for, that's actually a pretty nice, that's that's a nice, good thing, gesture for them to do. I'm just flabbergasted by this whole freaking thing. So. On the secret in today's episode. Alrighty, ladies and gentlemen, that is it for this reaction video. Let me know what you think in the comments. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you all for the next one.